going on the way to the gym. Before work, you faint. You make an appointment with your doctor. Who sends you for routine tests. You're invited to see the cardiologist. Who tells you you have aortic valve stenosis. And that urgent heart surgery is necessary. In order to prolong your life. You leave the hospital stunned. On the way home, you see references to the heart. Everywhere. Travelling down the escalator, you see Starbucks puts the heart back into coffee. Advertisement for new play at Apollo Theatre. It felt empty when the heart went out of it, but it's all right now. A single man, heartbreaking film. What do all these references to the heart mean to you? One for the heart, a sonnet. First, I have to tell you, it's yellow. Not red like Valentine's Day, not even pink like girls' pajamas or strawberry jello. And not, despite whatever you might think, easy to get inside. When they tell you you only have to open your heart, what they don't say is that they will have to saw your breastbone in half to <coughs> it. But what I want you to know is this, that the surgeon could have been a midwife. He slit the pericardium with only a kiss of his knife. Saline dripped while his hand held your life. The full-blooded padoom, padoom coming back. Open valve, full-throated cry, with barely a slap. Heart surgeon. I am not a heart surgeon because I would not be able to avoid cliches. I would not be able to pass the butchers without thinking of animals who had had theirs cut out, a delicacy for human consumption at dinner parties, or calves who left behind distraught mothers to chew the cud. I would not be able to ride the escalators and see Starbucks puts the back into coffee. Does coffee need one too? <laughs> I could not be a heart surgeon because at the end of your life, I watched those shallow breaths decrease and then that faint beat stop. So suddenly it seemed. And where, as a heart surgeon, would that have left me? I wrote one for the heart after watching live open heart surgery as it was screened at the Wellcome Collection last May. Um, it was, as you can imagine, a real eye-opener. And I was incredibly moved to be there, along with the audience, with, uh, of, amongst whom were some previous patients of Mr. Francis Wells, the surgeon performing the heart valve repair operation that we were watching. And in the discussion afterwards, one of those patients said it was as if she were watching her own heart operation, and she was overwhelmed with gratitude. I wrote the poem as a sonnet, as this is the most this is the form most often used to express love, and certainly I would say, apart from the awe and fascination that was present in that screening, there was, um, and a certain amount of trepidation, of course, um, there was very, very palpably the, the surgeon's love for his profession and the patients and the rest of us in the audience um, with a certain kind of love for the, um, for the surgeon performing it, and love seemed to be the overriding emotion. And I wrote the um, poem Heart Surgeon after reading Frank O'Hara's Why I'm Not a Painter, and then thinking about the responsibilities of jobs and professions, and heart surgery was very much on my mind. I began to imagine what it must be like to be a heart surgeon, see references to the heart everywhere, turn on the radio driving to work, all the song titles with heart in them, and then to actually hold a human heart in your hand. I'm Cheryl Moskowitz and I write fiction as well as poetry and I've worked as a storyteller and a writing facilitator in a variety of different health and community settings including hospitals, prisons, hospices and daycare centres. And in all of these capacities I've had the opportunity to witness the way in which writing contribute to well-being as well as giving voice to uneasy emotions. I teach on the Creative Writing and Personal Development MA at Sussex University and was a co-founder in 1997 of Lapidus, the National Association for Literary Arts and Personal Development. And it was through my work at Lapidus that I first got to know Wendy. And about a year ago, I was chatting to Professor Chambers at a social function. We were talking about our different jobs and he asked me what I was doing and I said I was working with patients who had strokes and I was using poems to help bring memory back. 
And he said he wondered if there was a place for this sort of work in his heart valve replacement clinic. And I didn't think much more about it, but then in the cold light of the next day, he phoned me up to talk about this project further. He's very keen on the integrations of arts and science, and the arts actually happening in his clinic. Um, so, <laughs> for the last year, Wendy and I have been um, in the process of um, thinking about, and now just very, very recently, actually making applications for a grant to support our work in the cardiology department of Guy's and St. Thomas's Hospital. Yeah, Professor Chambers is very keen to develop another side to his clinic, and he wants it called the Poetry Clinic. He wants for his patients to know that it's a in his view, it's as much important as the, they have, of the time that they spend with us as the time they spend with him, because he says he doesn't have the space and the time in the day to follow his patients' emotions through. And he doesn't just want them to see a counsellor, he wants them to actually do something for themselves that they can take away and feel proud of. And so the project will be to work alongside medical staff. We will be very much under his remit. He is still the boss of the clinic. And we will be working with carers as well to, um, to explore all their feelings and thoughts around heart disease. So as we're still at very exploratory um, stages of that, we wanted to take the opportunity here at this, at this symposium just to to give a little bit of background of, of our thinking. The heart um, has long been regarded as an emotional organ. Descriptions of emotional experiences as heartbreaking or heartwarming, and of compassionless individuals as hard-hearted or heartless, are more than terms of praise. They reveal the heart's cultural legacy as a physical and symbolic space in the body where emotions are felt and experienced. In our modern age, however, it is the brain that is reified as the site of our emotions, our cells, the organ associated with the presence of life, or indeed its absence. To be brain dead is now the official definition of death in the Western world, where once it had been the cessation of the heartbeat. With modern advances in heart surgery, open heart valve replacement and whole heart transplants, the heart in some ways has been relegated to the role of pump that distributes blood around the body and forced to take its place as a frivolously drawn symbol alongside the yellow smiley faces of Clinton card commercialism. There must be a way to bridge this gap from old ways in which the heart had pride of place in cultural importance and significance making it the most untouchable of organs to the modern scientific age, where a surgeon can quite literally remove a heart from a body, do things to it, I'm not quite sure what, and then put it back like a car mechanic might do to an engine. Through poetry, the heart can endure as a symbol of love and authenticity and also be honoured for the vital organ that it is. Through poetry, we think that we can reconnect to the ways in which the heart knows, the way in which it is our heart and not our medulla that is swollen with pride when someone we love achieves something great, the way it's our heart and not our cerebellum that's broken by grief when we lose the people and things that are most important to us and the way in which we can think and act from the core of our hearts and not only the cortex of our brains. In The Guardian last year, Nick Laird wondered why more poets haven't engaged with the insights into human behaviour that science gives us. In general, he said, modern poets have taken more easily to Freud than to Darwin. But should we hope for a poetry of science, and what would it be like? Will it engage with scientific vocabulary, or, in doing so, will it disengage from matters of the heart? Laird refu uh, refers to Miroslav Holov as a great scientist poet of modern times, who we've just heard about, thank you, and this is from his poem, Heart Transplant. After an hour, there's an abyss in the chest, created by the missing heart, like a model landscape where humans have grown extinct. Atrium is sown to atrium, aorta to aorta, 
three hours of eternity coming and going. And when the heart begins to beat and the curves jump like synthetic sheep on a green screen, it's like a model of a battlefield in which life and spirit have been fighting and both have won. The language here is scientific, specifically medical, but is used to reflect upon love, the fear of death as conscious experiences, not as unconscious processes. Crucially, the heart is used metaphorically, not literally, in its romantic incarnation of the seat of emotion. Indeed, the latter is subordinated to the former. So, what do we hope to achieve? with this project? Well, we've sort of identified, I think, five objectives at the moment and some outcomes. One, to facilitate. We hope to give heart patients an emotional language to help manage their condition. To also to challenge. We want to lift some of the taboos that might exist around the heart. Uh, my mother is very, very old, and she said to me the other day, she said, well, I don't know, she said, if you have a heart transplant, how can you say to someone, I love you with all my heart? Fortunately, she went on to another topic before I had time to answer. <laughs> we also want to enable, um, we want to give space to think, uh, for, space for the patients and their families and carers to think about what the heart actually does as a physical organ um, and to, to take it out of its enshrinement. We want to bond, we want to create a familiarity with the heart as part of the self that can still be nourished even when we're well or when we're ill. We want to reassure, let patients know that they're not alone in this and that there are hundreds and thousands of people undergoing the same treatment with the same kind of worries and fears. And then finally, our anticipated outcome. Well, we, we would plan to be measuring um, and looking at the ways in which um, writing can make a positive contribution um, in terms of relieving stress, anxiety, but also the ways in which writing might be seen as an indicator of the patient's condition and in, in that way possibly become a, a useful diagnostic tool. Um, we've been looking at a paper um, from Auckland uh, where the um, researchers have been looking at patients' drawings of the heart, both before and after heart surgery and in recovery, and looking at the, the, uh, the discrimination in terms of, of size and the way those drawings are, are, are done by the patients and, that, and how that relates to their, their relative um, states of recovery. Um, and we, we think that there might be something um, on similar lines that can be looked at in terms of the metaphors and the writing that the patients are doing um, that can also act as a sort of communication with, with their doctors. And also, as poets, we know that no work is ever properly finished until it has been shared. And ultimately, it will not just be through the doing, but also the sharing of the work um, produced by the patients, their doctors and families, which will in the end be the most informative as to whether the project um, has been successful. I Carry Your Heart With Me by E.E. E. Cummings. I carry your heart with me. I carry it in my heart. I am never without it anywhere. I go, you go, my dear, and whatever is done by only me is your doing, my darling. I fear no fate. For you are my fate, my sweet. I want no world, for beautiful you are my world, my true. And it is you are whatever a moon has always meant. And whatever a song will always sing is you. Here is the deepest secret nobody knows. Here is the root of the root and the bud of the bud. And the sky of the sky of a tree called life, which grows higher than the soul can hope or mind can hide. And this is the wonder that's keeping the stars apart. I carry your heart. I carry it in my heart. <laughs> Thank you.